Hello, welcome to the Better Outcomes Show, where we explore the possibilities of a new healthcare. Each episode, we bring you a conversation with leaders across the healthcare industry, exploring topics ranging from new treatment techniques and interventions to novel service delivery methods and business models. And now your host, Rafi Salazar from Rehab U Practice Solutions, a leader in patient engagement and retention strategy. Let's explore the possibilities of a new healthcare. Well, hello again. Welcome to another episode of the Better Outcomes Show. I'm your host, Rafi Salazar from Rehab U Practice Solutions. Well, the wait is over for those of you that were waiting. <laughs> uh, the book, The Better Outcomes A Guide to Humanizing Healthcare, is now available and uh, can be purchased on Amazon. We got the paperback, the Kindle version. You can buy it from Barnes and Noble and other places where you can buy books. Um, but they tell me that Amazon is where everybody buys books these days. <laughs> At least I know that's where I buy most of my books these days. So go to Amazon, search for Better Outcomes, A Guide to Humanizing Healthcare. In that book, I discuss the eight changes, fundamental changes and commitments that healthcare organizations should make in order to improve both clinical outcomes, patient satisfaction, and then ultimately um, just delivering a better quality of care, both in the experience, but then also the, the clinical outcomes, right? It doesn't do you any good to have uh, the, the warm fuzzies when you leave a clinician's office if you don't ultimately get better. And then no one wants to go to a clinician's office if it feels like you're getting your teeth pulled without Novocaine, right? <laughs> so this book um, takes the years of experience that I have in the healthcare industry, both as a consultant, as a professor, and as a uh, clinic owner and clinician that has worked frontline for you know, some years. <laughs> I'm not super, super old, um, but I've done a lot in, in healthcare. I've been very, very blessed to, to have a very wide ranging career from working with adults with uh, behavioral health and developmental disabilities all the way to um, veterans experiencing chronic pain and PTSD and the link between those two. And um, you know, now I'm, I'm running a, a private outpatient multidisciplinary clinic treating patients in, in chronic pain. So I've been able to do a little bit and uh, some of the research that I did at the university, some of the, the projects that I've been involved in all make it into the book. I've tried to keep it very uh, practical. So while the, the topic itself is very high level, while each of the commitments or each of the, uh, the chapters covers a high level topic, like the first the first chapter is on the biopsychosocial model and taking a biopsychosocial approach. That's a very high level topic. I try to drill it down and be very specific about practical applications and practical strategies. So if that sounds like something you're interested in, head on over to uh, Amazon, search for Better Outcomes, A Guide to Humanizing Healthcare, and buy it there. You can also find a link to the About page at Rehab U Practice Solutions slash books. That gives you a little brief description of the book, link to purchase, makes it a little easier. Um, and if you are an organization, healthcare uh, clinic or practice or hospital system, and you're looking for a way to develop a system that does implement some of those changes that you read about in the book, um, Rehab U Practice Solutions offers training and, and consulting engagements that work around that framework that we have developed at um, both through this sh the this show, the Better Outcome Show, and the and the book, and and some of our work with clients, you can find out about that at uh, rehabupracticesolutions.com. Click on the link that says "What We Do" and uh, go from there. All right, this week we have uh, Dr. Ronnie Shalev on the show. He is a, an engineer by trade. He goes into a little bit about uh, his career and, and what brought him to doing what he's doing now, but he has 25 plus years experience primarily in the artificial intelligence space and then applying artificial intelligence and, and AI design into, into various industries. The one aspect that always interested him was uh, how AI and healthcare kind of intersected, how, how you could make healthcare better through the use and implementation of uh, artificial intelligence. So 
um, whether it's whether you're using it for for data archiving, data visualization, and then most recently, his most recent project is in diagnostic imaging, specifically cardiac uh, diagnostic imaging. So. This is one of those things. I love having conversations with smart people that are doing things that are kind of all over the place in healthcare because it pushes me to learn. And um, it's just stuff that that I would never really talk about, right? I, I, I would have no reason to talk about uh, AI and diagnostic imaging if it wasn't for this, <laughs> this podcast, right? That being said, I do feel sometimes like I'm way out of my depth <laughs> talking with some of these folks. I think there's a couple... Uh, a couple times in this interview where, I, where I'm asking uh, Dr. Shalev about uh, how long it took him to like train the AI system. And I have no idea what training systems are in, in general. Like I had no idea going into this, right? Um, and I'm like, oh, that must take like weeks or months, right? And he's like, oh, it takes about two days. I'm like, oh, okay. Like shows you how much I know. But it was a, it was a very interesting discussion. Um, f- more from his bio here. So when reading an X-ray or an imaging, uh, doctors draw conclusions based on their expertise. For a cardiologist, analyzing a heart image takes hours because the heart is a moving organ. So they have to look at every frame of the X-ray or the, the imaging modality in order to make a decision. It's very tedious. It can cause burnout and increases backlogs of patients waiting for, for their images to be read, right? So Dr. Shalev created an AI that automatically does this, does the analysis, so the doctors get a real-time second opinion. This result is faster and more accurate uh, cardiac imaging interpretations leading to more satisfied patients. Um, so, And what we talk about here is that the, the system that he developed doesn't create any um, or doesn't provide any clinical recommendations. Basically what it does is it takes the, the series of images that come from a study and gives the, the physician just a real-time view or analysis of those images. So it doesn't say you should treat it this way or this should be the, your next step. It really just says this is what the image shows, right? Or this is what the series of images shows. Um, and then clinicians can use that in their diagnostic uh, procedure or you know developing treatment recommendations. I think one thing that everybody that everybody we've had on the show that's involved in healthcare tech, either developing something like this, like a diagnostic, an artificial intelligence algorithm, basically that's di- uh, analyzing diagnostic images, or um, we've had folks on like the folks from Tracer who had that video uh, tool that watched people move and then could analyze their movement and tell you where they were. Um, where the person was dysfunctional or where, where, the, where there was an imbalance. Everybody that has this, uh, this area of work or is in, in, this, that's in this area of work, in this artificial intelligence or this healthcare tech work, they're all very quick to say, um, we're not replacing clinicians. And <laughs> so he says that too in this, in, this, uh, in this episode here, that they're not replacing clinicians. And I think specifically around healthcare tech and specifically around some of the tools that we're developing, like I, I was blown away that you could train an, an, an AI machine like this to, to analyze cardiac images in like two days. Like if we look at this as kind of this, oh my gosh, they're gonna take our jobs away type thing, it can really hinder us employing something that really has the, the potential to impact a whole lot more people. Whereas I look at technology like this as really a force multiplier. It is something that increases our re- reach, increases our accuracy, and improves the level of care, increases the level of care that we're able to deliver to our patients and our clients. And uh, one of the things that that I really value in all of these discussions is just coming back to that idea of these are tools they are not replacing clinicians because healthcare is a human experience, like I say in the book, like I say all the time. Healthcare is built on relationships and trust, specifically the relationships that form between clients and patients and those clinicians. So none of these technological tools sh- are, should ever be looked at a way to replace that relationship. It's really just a way to augment and maybe um, increase the, the effect of that relationship. So without any further ado, here is Dr. Shalev talking about his company, Dyad Medical, and then analyzing or using AI to analyze cardiac imaging. Well, hey, Dr. Shalev, welcome to the show. How are you? Very good, thank you. How are you? 
I'm doing all right. I want to talk with you about uh, artificial intelligence and using that to read diagnostic imaging. But before we do that, just kind of give us a brief rundown of, of who you are, of Dyad Medical, and then we'll kind of go from there. Well, uh, as we said before the show, uh, I'm a, essentially a computer scientist uh, which uh, who was involved in image analysis uh, most of my uh, career. Uh, recently, or in the last, let's say, 10 years, I, I was exposed to the uh, uh, lag of the uh, healthcare industry behind what I call technology. Yeah. Uh, so I thought it would be really a good idea to bring everybody to the same uh, starting point with the uh, development of the cloud uh, technology deep learning and AI and image processing and so forth. So uh, this is what we do in Diet Medical. We develop a, a platform which uh, focuses on analysis of cardiac medical images. Uh, the reason I am emphasizing cardiac is because right now we are an organ specific platform uh, rather than the general image analysis platform. Yeah, so it's specifically about the heart, about cardiology and before you said there were four types of uh, images or diagnostic images that y'all analyze. What are those? Right. So these are modalities, what they refer to as modalities. So we support cardiac MRI uh, or what they call CMR, cardiac CT, uh, IV OCT or intravascular imaging uh, using near infrared light and they also echocardiograms. Okay, cool deal. So. How does this how does this work? I guess somebody goes to a hospital, they might have an echo done or an IVOCT done, and then what the physician or the radiologist can upload the the images or the data into the into the platform, and then what happens? Well, it depends on the settings. There, there okay. are two main main settings. One is research settings where they do clinical study, you know, post processing, and people. Uh -huh. Uh, they essentially sit in front of, of the computer and they load images that they already have in their storage. The clinical settings, which you are describing, uh, we are essentially within their current workflow. We okay. do not interfere with their current workflow. This, the images are being scanned and they, they are being sent by their system to their uh, storage, uh, which can be a PAX or EMR or EHR system. And we have a, a piece of software, which we call a watchdog, essentially uh, querying the, the PAC system when there is a new study that we can analyze. Once we identify a study that we can analyze, we analyze it, we send back the result to the hospital. Now the, the doctor does not really have to do anything different from what they do today, but they do have an indication that there is insight or analysis results from Diad Medical. They can choose to open it, or they can simply choose to select the report generated, automatically generated by the medical, uh, or they can even select to ignore it completely. That's their choice. Uh, really, this emphasizes the concept that we do not replace them. We just support them and give them a tool to maybe uh, potentially accelerate their work and make it uh, slightly more efficient. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Every time you talk about technology and healthcare, it's funny. We've done a lot of interviews with a lot of folks that are developing platforms like this, and the number one thing they all say is we're not replacing clinicians. We're not, we're not replacing clinicians. <laughs> so, yeah. Um, okay. So this system is automatic. The, the, the videos or the, the images are getting uploaded. They're getting scanned. A little note or a little notification is going off to the doctor for them to um, either review or, or see the report that's coming out. How is this being done? I'm, I'm assuming there's, you've, you said you've built an artificial uh, intelligence platform? Is it is it run by an algorithm? I think we were talking before about how it's always learning, right, with the data that's coming in. Right. Tell us, tell us a little bit about that. Okay, so essentially uh, there is a, the, this concept called back-end or front-end, right? Uh -huh. The front-end is what the, the user is, uh, is in interacting with, and the back-end, <clears throat> which in our case, uh, our case runs on AWS today, uh, uh, it gets the messages from the front end. So let's say there is a study being scanned. Uh, we already trained our system in such a way that as soon as we identify a new study, we can analyze it for whatever parameter the, the clinicians are interested in. Yeah. Once we have the results, we get rid of the images. We do not keep them. And then we send the results back to the hospital to, for review or and for further analysis if they choose to. Over time, 
obviously we can select uh, a few, uh, let's say, uh, higher end candidates who know what they do, and we can incorporate their input to, into the additional training of, of our system to improve our uh, results. And this is something that can take place anytime uh, we choose to do it. Yeah. And then I'm assuming you're also, it's also collecting data and all that from the research studies, right? You've got a bunch of people that have all these images on, on file and they've been loading them up there and it's right. kind of just increasing the speed at which the, the system can, can analyze, right? Exactly. Not, not only this, we can even enable a company or a hospital uh, to essentially uh, do what we call a ba batch processing. Let's say they have I don't know, 5,000 data, 5, data sets of some retrospective study that they did at some point. They can, using our system, they can run analysis on all 5,000 at once without really human intervention. After a, a few, some time, they get the results of all 5,000 uh, 5, patients. So uh, this is for research purposes, and obviously the conclusion can be uh, analyzed by them. Yeah, uh, we, we essentially tell them what we see on those images. We uh, do not make any recommendations for treatment at, at this point. Yeah, so it's not it's not so much interpretation. It's just this is what this is what the image has been analyzed, and this is the what we see in it, right? Exactly. That's what it contains. Yeah. Awesome. Well, I know we were talking before how you've been you started off in adults start basically building this thing, right? But now you're focusing a little bit more on the pediatric side. Tell me a little bit about, one, the challenge in developing an artificial intelligence platform that's going to analyze pediatric cardiology images and modalities and uh, kind of how you kind of crosswalked it or, or walked it backwards to get there. Right. So so the, 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 the concept with deep learning, especially when you train a system, train quote unquote, you train a system, essentially you input to it a few images and then what the expert told you about those images. This is what they call supervised learning, right? Yeah. And now to do a, a decent analysis and train a decent system, you need a few thousand studies to do the training. However, uh, with the children uh, or, or pediatrics, you don't have so many uh, uh, images or studies. Uh, specifically not from one single hospital. You would need to collect from multiple hospitals. Now with children, you have something which is even further makes it even more difficult. Uh, a six months a year old uh, baby does not have the same heart as a five year old or yeah. a 16 year old, right? So yes, we do say pediatrics zero to 18, but you really have to divide it even further beyond those 18 years, right? So it depends on the, you know, how old the child is. So what we do, is we uh, we connected we connected with a few pediatric hospitals in the world. They gave us some data. When I say gave, I mean sold us some data. Uh, we had the experts annotate those data so we can train an initial engine or initial AI engine. And now uh, we are exploring the concept of federated learning, where we can retrain the system and improve it over time. And this is really a really, really good approach because with the federated learning, you don't really, the, the hospital does not necessarily have to share their data, which means the HIPAA compliance is being kept in place. So there is no issue of a PHI or personal health information uh, sharing with us. Uh, and hopefully we'll get a very good results uh, uh, to support all those uh, few, unfortunately, few uh, pediatric uh, cardiologists uh, that actually do treat uh, uh, small children. Yeah. How long does it typically take to get one of those, you said you have to train this engine at the beginning, how long does it typically take to do that so that the engine itself is is producing or, or analyzing something and coming up with a report that's that's serviceable? Well, it depends on two parameters. One is how many data sets you have. The other uh -huh. one is what kind of hardware you use. Yeah, uh, we have an extremely powerful uh, uh, with multiple GPUs, uh, NVIDIA system, essentially with many, many GPUs, lots of memory, and which can train essentially use a, a few tens of thousands of studies that we already have. Uh, a training with our platform and our data set can take uh, maybe half a day. Oh, holy smokes. So not not long at all. When you're talking about like training this data thing, I'm thinking like, holy smokes, is it taking you like six months, a year to analyze well, all the data what, initially? 
with a personal computer that people work in the office normally, it can take three, four weeks. You, yeah. you, you, you click run and then you go take a vacation. So, <laughs> But with our system, it's really fast. And by the way, there are cloud systems that enable you to do this even faster. The problem is the cost. So we, we prefer to keep it in house. Yeah. Okay. Um, I'm trying to think of like, so assuming that, that, Let's say you've got the data set. You started building this this initial learning or training. Um, it's it's supervised learning, right? So I'm assuming you have folks on staff or had folks on staff that were kind of reviewing the the output that the that the machine was creating or that the the system was was putting out and basically verifying it for for efficacy and for accuracy and all that kind of stuff, right? Right, exactly. So it's a, they're not on staff. We do have a few subcontractors that do the, the work. Uh, we devised a few methods, statistical methods, to verify the, the level of their work uh, uh, and make sure that they do the right, uh -huh. you know, they, they perform their job very quickly. It's a few tens of, uh, a few tens of, uh, of uh, what we call experts. Yeah. Now, we also make sure that those experts have various varying level of skill levels. So, so what 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 we can this is how we we improve the generalization of our system. Uh, various levels of skill, very skill levels of the annotators, plus uh, multiple sources of of those studies. Uh, it's not not every not every uh, cardiac MRI machine outputs the same level of uh, the same quality of image. You know, GE machine has a very different uh, looking image from, I, I don't know, Siemens. Yeah. Uh, echocardiogram, a handheld device has a very different image quality from, uh, let's say, a, a bedside uh, echocardiogram uh, device. So we make this uh, mix of levels and skill levels, and uh, this is how we train the system, yeah. Yeah. So. Um, it, it's almost essentially like running a like a statistical analysis, right? Like you're you're almost like you're doing your own research study, and you're, you're coming out of the confidence interval at the end, right? Right, right. And by the way, we many in many cases we cancel experts, what we call experts. We, when I say cancel, I mean we we let them go. Uh, I'll give you an example, which is really obvious to understand. Uh, let's say I give an expert uh, ten images, and but I I duplicated the ten images, and now I have twenty. And I give this person uh, all 20 to annotate. So if we realize that this expert did not agree with himself or herself uh, at enough at a higher level, meaning you know they disagree with themselves yeah. uh, at enough higher level, then we, we essentially say, listen, you're not good enough for us because we need that we need you to agree to agree with yourself before we actually use your data to train our system. So that's one measure that we use to, for example, to make sure that the level, the work is done at the highest level possible. Yeah, that's interesting. Are there like standards out there that you can, um, like when you're developing this, that a, a benchmark, okay, we're going to give, you know, whatever, how many data sets to, to a professional or a clinician, they're going to have, so, you know, it's going to be duplicated. Like, is there a percentage number that's out there that's like, okay, this is a good benchmark. If they're, if they're 95% consistent, then that's good. Well, I think 95% is kind of an agreed upon number uh, by the statisticians. Uh -huh. uh, we try to be on the 98 and above percent uh, because we essentially say that there is nothing there that there is something, there are some things that open to interpretation. But before we do this, we'll give a very detailed uh, guideline. We essentially use the guideline of the uh, respective society. Uh, yeah. uh, they have to follow these guidelines. If they don't do it, well enough, or if they don't really understand it, or if they do not a very good job. In in our opinion, 98% is a better measure, although 95%, some people see it as a statistically good enough, so. Yeah, um, I mean, that's interesting. So um, you've got the 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 machine itself, or the, the system itself is analyzing this data. Is it, I'm assuming because it's just analyzing raw information that's coming from the system, it's not taking it like there is no input for the account of like, let's say this patient is a 34 year old morbidly obese patient versus another patient who's 
you know, relatively healthy and hasn't had any issues, but now they're presenting with some cardiac dysfunction. You leave all of that to the clinicians to figure out and the, the machine learning is kind of just doing the analysis of the images or is there, is there space for them to take into account this is a normal study, quote unquote, typical study, except for given these extenuating circumstances in this patient's data set or whatever? We do take this into account in the training. Uh, this is what we call a quote unquote feature. Uh -huh. However, however, in our system, we allow them to do to, to, conf to configure their preferences in such a way that they can make a decision based on one of these parameters. Uh, one of the biggest or greatest use of this concept that we developed in the company is that, uh, uh, let's say they wanted to uh, be notified of something which is uh, out of the ordinary according to some standard. Uh -huh. Let's say it can be an American standard, can be Chinese standard. Uh, each one of them can have their own standard, uh, depending on the on the population. So, yes, we do train our system taking in these into account, but the user may ignore or take it into account if they choose to, or they can modify it and select their own standard. Uh, in the USA, it can be the ASC, the American Society of Echocardiography. In China, they have a Chinese version of the same society. So each one of them can have their own table and our system allows configuration for this. Okay. So, and this system, if I understand it correctly, just automatically like a, a physician isn't selecting, you know, John Smith, patient A, to get this, their, their, their cardio, let's, let's say it's an EKG read by the, the platform. Everything that they're doing is automatically getting getting read, getting analyzed, and then right. if something trips, they get a, a little notification, right? Right, and they can select how they want to be notified because there is a, at some point, there is a notification fatigue by a doctor. You yeah. Know, every system gets their own. So what we try, we try to minimize it, and essentially we, of course, they can select to get an SMS or an email, but that's too much, I think. Yeah. Uh, so within the system, we do prioritization in such a way that we tell them, listen, when you log in, here are those that you wanted to be notified about. And, uh, you know, they are appear in red. We also have an indication in case somebody doesn't see colors clearly. So that this is what we call prioritization or work. Uh -huh. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I guess each each clinician or each organization gets to set up their own prioritization. Right. Right. right exactly. Right. All righty. Um, and I guess the other piece of this making it work is that the fact that it's not, it's not like a hard drive issue, right? Or software on like a computer. It's a, it's a cloud base, which means it can be used basically from anywhere, right? So any, any hospital or imaging center that's got an internet connection can use it, correct? Or are there different requirements? Like you need to have certain, like a certain All bandwidth or, or whatever. <laughs> You're, you're absolutely right. All you need is a browser, really, okay. uh, because we are a, we are a, a very small footprint type uh, application. If you have a browser, HTML5, that's enough. The, we don't really care if you have an iPad or, or a, a gaming platform or a gaming desktop. Anything uh -huh. that has a browser can work without any problem, yes. And have you all, um, the academic, I mean, is, is jumping out now. So have you all... St taken the the analyses from the uh, from the platform itself, and then compared that to like a, a cohort of uh, expert clinicians, and kind of seen where where it stands on the on the level of accuracy, or whether there's I guess discrepancy between clinicians, or if the if the analyses are more accurate. Right. Yeah. So this is what uh, we refer to as a held out set. Uh huh. Uh, essentially, it's a set that uh, some some experts. Experts with a uh, you know uh, plural experts uh, analyzed and and made decision uh, treatment decision in the past at some point, and uh, we run our system on the same uh, on the same data and we compare our results to theirs, uh, and this is by the way how we submit our FDA uh, clearance application, essentially showing them that we are just as good as those who already did it in the past. Uh, at the higher uh, are higher enough uh, performance uh, parameter. Yeah. So tell me about this FDA clearance. And what's what's the process? I'm assuming you, you've got to do this, or you've got to do this uh, experiment or, or this study, if you will, to show that the system is is producing at least at a, at a a standard level according to experts. How long does this process take? 
you know, all, all of that kind of stuff. Walk me through through getting the FDA clearances. Okay, so FDA clearance is a uh, it's, it's quite a tedious process yeah. to, to be through. <laughs> yeah, uh, it depends how many parameters we'd like to compare. Uh, you know, I can come up with one single parameter. It may take two months. Uh, if I have ten, then it may take much longer. Keep in mind that the more you re more parameters or indices, what they call ind indices, uh, uh, you need more data to do the the proof work. Yeah, essentially compared to actual results from other devices. Uh, so uh, this process, depending on the the resources that you we have, we 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 can they, today we can do in roughly three to four months. Again, uh, depending on data availability, if we already have the data in hand or not. Uh, that's one of the major parameters uh, that uh, impact the length of time that it takes. Uh, and that's that's really about it. Uh, all the rest of the FDA submission is has to do with the inner works of the company, yeah. how, how we do QA, how we, we document stuff and so on. Yeah. Yeah, it just seems like anybody that, that is trying to bring something into the healthcare market, this is going to be U.S. specific here, but... And it seems like the FDA, while doing its job to be very, you know, thorough and make sure that we're we're not harming patients, it's a lot of <laughs> it's a lot of paperwork, a lot of waiting, a lot of analysis, right? Right. It's a lot of analysis too. And to be honest, the issue of analysis is completely justified. Yeah. I, I support them. I mean, you do have to show that you're good enough, or at, le at least as but you're good not going to harm can. anybody, right? Right. Right. So. Uh, we are what you would call 510k class two device, uh, and we have to show it. All right, we, we can't just make the claim. So th that's what we do. Uh, the issue of documentation, yes, it's a pain. Uh, I can't uh, deny it, but I but I fully recognize its necessity. That uh... yeah, yeah, no, it's great. It's it's interesting to hear people that have gone through like the. They've, they've either uh, gone through the FDA and now they're on the other side. They've got their clearance and like, oh, you know, we, we, we cleared that hurdle. We got over and now we can get on to, right. to seeing patients and stuff like that. Um, well, Dr. Shalev, thanks so much for, for being on the show. I'm, I always ask folks, if there's one or two main points that you'd want people to walk away uh, with from the, from the episode about cardiac imaging or even about diet medical, what would they be? Well, uh, I do. I would like people to remember. It's really hard to uh, to uh, communicate this notion of being an organ specific platform. Yeah, uh, organ specific. Really, over time, we develop what you call domain expertise. Uh -huh. So yes, I'm a computer scientist, but over time, because I focus on the heart and not the brain. Uh, uh, it's important to remember that this is a huge advantage. Uh, Yes, I've heard about companies that do deep learning in a whole bunch of fields, but it's extremely difficult to scale this way, especially for a startup company. So that's one thing that uh, I'd like to, people to remember, the issue of organ-specific solution. In other words, uh, keep in mind, 50% uh, of the world does not have access to diagnostic, to expertise in diagnostic. Uh, being on the web essentially opens the world for those who don't have ac uh, uh, access. I know that uh, people like to talk about third world uh, countries that do not have access. For example, in Boston, in a single hospital, you have about 150 radiologists and, uh, and the population of Boston is about 700,000 people. In Liberia, they have uh, 5 million people uh, population and they have two radiologists, right? Holy so so yeah. it does not make any sense. However, there is a hidden problem here even in rural areas in the US, they don't necessarily have access to higher level diagnostic. What I'm offering is if you have an internet connection, you essentially have an immediately available second opinion of experts Yeah, available to you. It doesn't mean you have to go buy it. It just means that it's available for you to consult with in case you need yet another opinion for whatever diagnostic you make. Yeah, that's interesting. I I think that's one thing that's become more and more apparent over the last probably decade, maybe two decades when technology has been exploding is that it really does, the options are endless. So taking the time to really specialize is really, really where you get to see the power of that technology, right? If you're deep focused on this one, like you said, in this one organ, 
you're probably going to be able to be light years ahead of somebody that's trying to do the heart and the brain and the kidneys and the, and the liver and all kinds of stuff, at least like you said, in, in a way that's scalable and sustainable. And that, that uh, statistic about the availability of, of expert radiologists is, is crazy to me, 50%. So, well, um, Dr. Shalev, where can people find out more about you, about Diet Medical? I'm assuming there's a, there's a, a link they can go to and get a demo or something, right? <laughs> right, right. So on our website, diadmed.com, uh, essentially you can see who we are. You can con contact us uh, through an email link there that you have. Uh, we tend to respond to these, uh, uh, to these very, very quickly. Uh, and that's how they can, can communicate with the company. They can also communicate with me through LinkedIn, uh, Ronnie Shalev at uh, LinkedIn. Uh, that's really easy to do. And some people have done this before. So. Cool deal. All right. Well, Dr. Dr. Shalev, thank you very much. Have a good one. Thank you very much. You too. Well, I hope you enjoyed that conversation with Dr. Ronnie Shalev talking about Dyad Medical and using artificial intelligence to read and analyze diagnostic imaging, specifically cardiac diagnostic imaging. It's funny, one thing that I listen to now and I think about after you know going through this this episode again, this conversation is just the 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 rate at which specialization is becoming and has been really become very important for not only clinicians and clinical organizations, but even companies like this. So when you talk about just the vast quantity of data that's available just in a field like cardiology and the cardiac images and the, the four different modalities and all of the data sets that get created in a given year or given month even at some of these institutions or, or facilities, it's very difficult, and, and Dr. Shalev said this, it's very difficult to build something, a tool like this that scales, sustainably scales without a whole lot of intensive capital investment because there's literally an infinite amount of data that you could, could process and analyze and use to, to develop. Or even now that we get more and more understanding and knowledge through clinical research about what we should be studying or what you know, a new, uh, maybe a new technological uh, advancement allows us to, to create a new type of diagnostic imaging or diagnostic test. Like all of that data that's available just becomes very unmanageable for one organization. So you can't have one organization that can analyze every you know, every kind of uh, of imaging modality for, for the heart and the liver and the lungs and the, the kidneys or something like that, for example. So specialization is almost a necessity at this point. And I would say, and I would argue that it it is the same for those of us in the clinical world who are involved in frontline clinical service delivery or, the, or what I would call the treating of patients, right? simply because of the amount of data and the amount of information that we have available at our fingertips, the amount of science, if you would, that we have available at our, our fingertips, you can't just be, I'm, I'm from the physical therapy, occupational therapy world, so I'm just gonna use that as an example, but you can't just be a physical therapy clinic, right? Like we, we offer physical therapy services. Well, what, do, you, do you offer physical therapy services for total knee replacements, for um, upper extremity disorders for uh, low back pain. Um, we just hired somebody at the clinic who who does women's health and, and pelvic floor physical therapy. Like all those areas could be specialisms in and of themselves. And not that you don't have the capability to do that. You know, I've, I've worked, the, the primary area of, of practice for me has been upper extremity rehabilitation, basically neck to fingertip. Um, and that's the and it's been musculoskeletal and orthopedic in nature. So I have the ability to treat somebody. My license allows me to treat somebody who's maybe experienced a stroke or CVA or something like that and has upper extremity weakness. But my my clinical expertise, the area that I spend a lot of time treating, is orthopedic musculoskeletal, basically hand dysfunction, right? <laughs> right. So not that I can't, 
but I'm probably not going to be as effective or that patient would probably be better served going to somebody who has a specialization in that area, right? Um, and I think we we forget that as clinicians and clinic owners. We try to be sort of a jack of all trades. We try to be everything to everyone. And especially again, in this world, in this time where just there's infinite areas and infinite amount of information out there about clinical best practices and clinical guidelines and areas of practice. Like, are you really doing the best by your, by your patients to try to be that jack of all trades, right? I would much rather, at least the way I view it, I would much rather make a referral to somebody who I know is specialized in some area, right? Rather than try to do it myself. We had somebody come in uh, to the clinic recently and they had uh, a diagnosis of Parkinson's and they were they were really looking for some some high level treatment and we didn't have it available but we knew that there was uh, a clinic down at downtown that had that did the the LSVT therapy the the big therapy for uh, folks with Parkinson's and we made the referral without thinking twice about it <laughs> um, someone once told me when it came to like business development and that sort of thing is that you you have to say no or else your yes is meaningless so if you're saying yes to everybody it it doesn't mean anything you're not discerning whether or not you can actually and effectively help somebody right um, but if you say no the practice of saying no means that one you're more intentional about who you say yes to and it means that when you do say yes, it means something. It means that you can actually help that individual. Um, and sure, there, there are some organizations that maybe they've got clinicians in every specialty area and they can manage it because they just have the uh, deep enough bench, right? Um, I'm thinking primarily of, of the small clinics that I've worked with in the past or that even that I've run now, there's only seven clinicians on staff in the at Proactive, the clinic that I run, and there's just no way we're going to be able to do be everything to everybody, right? We've got a couple areas of specialization, and that's really where we focus on. And sure, if somebody you know finds us and wants to come come to our clinic for to receive services, maybe in an area to, that's tangential to where most of our clinical expertise lies. I mean, we we can see them, but if it's something that that is truly a specialization or something like that, we will refer them out just because it's, that's just the right thing to do. <laughs> so anyways, that, that's my thought on, on sustainability and being a, a jack of all trade and, and drilling down. So anyways, um, thank you to Dr. Shalev for being on the show. We'll link to Dyad Medical and all the ways you can contact him in the show notes. Um, and that's kind of it. If you like today's show, head on over to iTunes, leave us a rating and review. It helps people find the show. If you happen to be interested in reading about healthcare, and I would assume if you're listening to a podcast about healthcare, you're probably interested in reading about healthcare. Um, the, the new book, Better Outcomes, A Guide to Humanizing Healthcare, uh, covers topics that's related that are related to truly uh, patient-centered care, taking a biopsychosocial approach to service delivery, patient engagement, interpersonal communication, and developing long-term relationships with patients. Um, and it's worth your time to read. <laughs> I'm gonna tell you that. So through an exploration of both the clinical research and real life examples and cases, like I said, both my time at the university and then as a consultant, as a practice owner, as a clinician that's been in and out of a few major healthcare systems, um, the book really outlines and supports what I call a vision of a new healthcare, where, where skilled, competent, and caring clinicians care for engaged patients to promote better clinical outcomes, deliver unmatched satisfaction, and lasting relationships. So if that sounds like something you would be interested in, head on over to Amazon, just search for Better Outcomes, A Guide to Humanizing Healthcare, or go to RehabYouPracticeSolutions.com, click on the tab for books, and it'll take you to a link that you can go purchase the book directly from there. Um, and if you are a healthcare organization and you're looking to develop a system that implements some of this framework into 
applying a biopsychosocial approach to your method of doing business, what I call a bottom up approach to healthcare service delivery or something in that realm, head on over to www.rehabupracticesolutions.com. Click on the tab that says what we do and just read about how we work with our clients and how we might be able to help you implement this vision of a new healthcare. Until the next time, folks, be safe, be healthy. I will talk to you then. Thanks for listening to the Better Outcomes Show, where we explore the possibilities of a new healthcare. Our hope is that you walk away from each episode informed, equipped, and empowered to push the boundaries in your own practice or business. We want to give you the tools to help you build strong, long-lasting relationships with your patients and clients helping meet their goals, improve their health, and achieve better outcomes. Learn more at www.rehabupracticesolutions.com. We'll catch you on the next episode.